Welcome Guardians to a special episode of the DTR Podcast. I am your host Jay, the content manager here at the Tracker Network. And my co-host this evening will be Jay Rambo 9119. Jay Rambo, what's up, man? Uh, how are you doing, Jay? How are you? Thank you so much for joining Excellent. me. Excellent. Thank you for asking. Our special guest on this episode will be Jason Schreier from Kotaku and the author of Blood, Sweat, and Pixels. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Hello. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. So we have a ton of questions to ask Mr. Schreier and a ton of topics to discuss over the course of this hour. But before we dive into all of that, I do have a few housekeeping things that I do have to get out the way. So you guys can find the DTR podcast on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, and the Google Play Store at Destiny Tracker Podcast. The show is recorded on Fridays at 7.45 p.m. Eastern on Twitch.tv slash Destiny Track. If you guys would like to support the show, you guys can, you guys can subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and then follow us on Podbean. You can use our promo code DTR for 10% off your Gamer Subs GG order. All right, Jason Schreier, I'm going to pass over the torch on to you. Do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am the news editor at Kotaku.com, which means that I edit the news, um, I guess. I, I suppose that's what it means. No, it means that I, I write and report and edit and do a lot of the uh, uh, do a lot of articles, do a lot of behind the scenes stuff and help work with my the rest of my talented team to keep Kotaku.com running. Um, and I also write books on the side. Blood, Sweat, and Pixels just came out a couple of months ago. It's about uh, the making of video games. And I will hopefully be starting work on a, on a new project in the near future, although I still don't know exactly what that's going to be, but we shall see. Sweet. So how did you get into journalism? So I always knew from a young age that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and I did a lot of reporting in high school. I was on my high school newspaper for a while. I was on my college newspaper. And then after college, I was just, I like moved back to my parents' house for a little while. And I was like, what do I want to do my, with my life? And eventually fell into like freelance writing for various news organizations, local news sites and whatnot. Um, and I wound up uh, covering a lot of like local government zoning board meetings and I don't know if you guys have ever been to a zoning board meeting but there is literally nothing more boring so <laughs> I'm sitting there in these zoning board meetings and I'm like wow what am I doing here um, and I started thinking what could I be writing about like I still want to be writing I still want to be reporting but what could I be writing about that is more interesting than this and I was like hmm video games <laughs> and so from there I started pitching stories and like looking up how to get into games writing writing about video games and pitching myself to as many places as possible and I was just super persistent and bothering people until they let me write for them eventually I got a gig at Wired um, and was writing for them for a while uh, until I got an email from Steven Totillo, who's my editor at Kotaku, and he was like, hey, I, I'm taking over Kotaku, and I wanted to talk to you about an opportunity, and that was in January of 2012, so about six years ago, and so I've been at Kotaku since then. Nice, congrats. That's my life story. Awesome. Just, you, know, you don't need to read the memoir, you just got it all. <laughs> so what was your first video game article at Kotaku, if you can remember? Oh my god, my first article at Kotaka, I don't remember. Man, I don't even think there's a way I can look that up, otherwise I'd look it up for you. But I do not remember at all. There, I mean, actually, regularly, I find articles from 2012, from 2013, even later, that I just do not recall writing at all. Like, it, it gets to the point when you write as much as yeah. uh, Kotaku staff do. We are all writing tons and tons of stuff. We publish the site. We publish new articles on Kotaku um, pretty much every half hour. Oh, wow. Um, when you're writing as much as we do, you just forget things like yeah. things just like filter out of your memory and so you'll find old articles and and just look at them and say wait a minute what i wrote this <laughs> uh, so that happens to me all the time so yeah i wish mm -hmm. i could remember that would be kind of a fun historic anecdote but i do not remember it was probably something small mm -hmm. just like as a test to to make sure i could use the the cms the content management system and mm -hmm. all that so which article was your favorite then since you can't remember 
I don't have a favorite. They're like, mm. it's like asking me to pick my favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> I know everyone secretly has a favorite child, but uh, I don't have a favorite article. I, 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 there's a lot of stuff that I'm proud of, mm-hmm. but to me, it's like I'm proud of some of the long form reporting I've mm-hmm. done that wound up turning into the book that I wrote. And I'm also proud of some of the dumb, like, one liners that I wrote, like, one sentence articles. Um, <laughs> uh, like, I, I wrote, uh, an article that was uh oh man so in 20 i think it was like 2014 or 2015 when the supreme court of the united states legalized gay marriage um i wrote an article that was just uh like a link to a tweet of Mm -hmm. that being announced and the headline was united states copies fire emblem because fire emblem had just added gay marriage like a couple (laughs) of months earlier and so that's still like one of my favorite articles even though it took me two seconds to write so to me i i think that that doing this job i enjoy both having fun with it and also taking it seriously because i think when you're covering video games you can't just be like hello i am mr serious reporter put on my fedora and (laughs) and just insist that everything has to be investigative reporting um and i do like try to do investigative reporting when I can, mm. but I also believe that you have to have fun with the job. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, J Ram, just going to pass it over to you. Yeah. Um, do you have an article in your mind or or a story that that you've worked on that was very controversial that really tested your ability to be a writer? Uh, tested it in what way? Um, tested it in the way that you wanted to break the story, but maybe y- you knew you couldn't at the right moment in time. Yeah, actually, I have a good example of that. Um, So this is actually a little bit of interesting inside baseball. So one of the things that I'm really proud of at Kotaku that we do is we're first to a lot of stories. We get a lot of good scoops. Um, We break news that isn't just like, hey, a press release just hit our inbox or like, hey, this this trailer is out or whatever. We're not just regurgitating stuff. Um, So I remember a couple of years ago, um, do you guys remember the video game website Joystick? Yeah. Yeah, so Joystick was this big prominent game site owned by AOL. So I got, uh, I found out uh, at the beginning of a week, it was a Monday in like 2015, early 2015, something like that. Um, I found out the Joystick was shutting down. And so I was like, hey, this is big news. I want to break this news. Let me get this on the site. And so what I typically do in a case like this is once I have verified it, which I did, I'll reach out to the parties involved to make sure that they all have a chance to comment. And so <clears> in this <throat> case, I'm reaching out to Joystick's editor-in-chief. And so I reached out to the Joystick's editor-in-chief. We were talking for a while. And basically, I found out that they were worried. They wanted to find ways to, like, salvage people's uh, uh, like immigration statuses, employment statuses, so that they could stay in the country. There were certain people who, who needed to be able to stay in the country, and they were really worried that like if the news came out too early, it might sabotage that. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know what? It's not worth it to publish a scoop if I'm going to actually damage people's lives like that. Like I would rather just sit and wait. So I sat on it. And then a couple days later, another website Recode, uh, I think it was, broke the news and we're like, hey, we've just learned that Joystick shut down. And I was like, part of me was like, damn it, I, I should have had that scoop. And the other part of me was like, well, you know what, like protecting people's lives and mm-hmm. like preventing them from potentially, even if even if the editor in chief, like even if none of that was true, uh, just the chances that like even if there was the slightest chance that I could damage someone's live uh, life, it would it would not be worth it to get that scoop. <clears throat> Very cool. So that's the sort of thing, those sort of calculations we we get into fairly often uh, on Kotaku. We have conversations about like how the, how will this impact people? What what sort of effect will this have on people's lives if we report this? Well, the re- the reason why I ask that is when it comes to Destiny news or Bungie news in general. Mm-hmm. For me yeah, personally, we should say we got to stay focused. What am yeah, I doing talking about non death? <laughs> Well, Kotaku for me is like the go-to website. Um, I love the podcast that you do, Split Screen. If you know those of you out there, if you haven't listened to it, definitely download that on onto your uh, your mobile device. Um, but sometimes there are other people out in the Twitter universe that when they see a Kotaku article, they may they sit there and go, "Oh well, it can't be legit. It's from Kotaku. They're wrong." You know, half the time they're right, half the time. And I'm glad that you're bringing this into light because. 
investigative reporting is so much more than just getting a scoop and then putting it on paper or typing it up and, and then sending it out. Like you actually have to go out and make sure that if you're going to break this story, hopefully the parties involved are not damaged in any way like that. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, I think I think as far as the community, especially the Destiny community, I think that and after I reported that Destiny 2 had been delayed from the fall of 2016 to 2017, that was when I got a lot of reactions of people being like, oh, this can't be true. Oh, my uncle said blah, blah, blah. Like a lot of snarky <laughs> comments. And then yeah. after a month later, after that was proven to be true, mm-hmm. I don't think people questioned us again after no, that. No, I, yeah. I would have to, I would agree 100%. You know, I'm, like I said, what the the way I look at it is, if Jason says it, it has to be true. <laughs> <laughs> I, we've worked pretty hard, and we actually will sometimes sit on things if we're not a hundred percent sure mm-hmm. about them. Um, another do- non Destiny example actually is that uh, a few weeks ago, as you guys might have seen, EA bought respawn the developer of titanfall Mm -hmm. and so we had heard that about a week before it happened and someone even sent us all the paperwork involving the deal but we just couldn't get enough confirmation and we wanted to be like triple sure 100 Mm -hmm. sure before we ran anything and so we wound up sitting on it and then it came out and we were kind of kicking ourselves for not having the (laughs) scoop but to me it's like i would rather miss out on nine out of ten scoops Mm -hmm. and get the one like then then like if then I don't know where I'm going with this. If I have 10 <laughs> scoops, right, and <laughs> one of them I know for sure is right and nine of them I don't, mm-hmm. I would rather, and like one of the nine happens to be wrong, I would rather get only one than get 10 and one of them be wrong. You know yeah. what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I'd rather have that that track record of 100% mm-hmm. accuracy than risk just getting something wrong. So that to me is really important and it's something that I try to help push um, and all of us do at Kajaka. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, I guess um, I guess I'll just get started with some of the questions I have for you. Then is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Sure. All right. So, um, back in October of 2015, you wrote this massive article describing the events that led up to the release of D1. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the events, you know, in your article kind of went through management shifts, um, certain people getting uh, released. I don't want to say fired, but released. Um, you even went as far as to say that this article is basically a, an investigative report. To answer some of the questions now i'm i ha- do have the article in front of me so i'm just going to read the questions that you have um but for the audience if you if you haven't read the article yet the questions um are how did such an ambitious game wind up with such a bare bones plot why did bungie seemingly change so much of the story before it shipped uh how did it ship in a state that required so much tweaking after it launched and what really happened behind the scenes so after you after you did all of this reporting and everything and now that we have the release of d2 can you see any themes that have developed within the development of D- destiny one kind of creep its head back into destiny two is there are, are there any overlapping I- ideas that you found um it's funny because i had actually thought that after so one of one of the biggest problems with destiny one and i illustrate this a lot in my book which has a chapter on destiny that's kind of an expanded like <laughs> the newer version more modern version of the the kotaku article right. and so one of the themes of that game was that it was here's this company and it's a whole ton of talented people they're a really huge studio now and they're hundreds of people and they're all working on this game but a lot of people don't really know what it is because they're making something that hasn't really been done before and there's this idea that it's it's like it could be a, a is it Halo? Is it World of Warcraft? Is it a cross between them? Is it something else entirely? Nobody really had that strong creative vision. And I think that's one of the reasons that we saw so many problems with early Destiny and why it took so long for them to hammer them out. And then once they knew what it was, they could make something like Taken King where they fix a lot of the problems and make a way better experience for everybody. Mm-hmm. So I figured that once they had that base of knowledge, they would put out Destiny 2 and it would be even better because they would just be iterating on all that and not making the same mistakes that they made in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out that was a little too optimistic. <laughs> they did make a lot of the same mistakes yeah. that they had in the past. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of factors. There always are. Um, I think that 
it was made in a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a big reboot of Destiny 2 uh, at some point in early 2016 when actually there was there had been a previous director who uh, a previous guy who was directing the game Mm -hmm. before Luke Smith, who's the current director, took over. Um, And so that guy was kind of put aside and Luke Smith he's not a bungee anywhere and then Luke Smith took over uh, I believe that was in April of 2016 but I might be misremembering don't hold me to that exact mm-hmm. month and so so if you think about it that way they really didn't have a ton of time to work on this game so mm-hmm. it, it had been it was like a 16 month period between the reboot and when the game actually shipped um, they, uh, they didn't have the advantage of Destiny 1 was something like 5 years in development if you mm-hmm. count all the pre-production time so, so they didn't have that kind of time um, they made the decision that they were only going to do add new content and not keep any of the older planets and whatnot, which I think hurt the game. Um, I think that just the the ambitious content release cycle is really hurting them. I think you you might remember that in D- after Destiny One they had two DLCs, Dark Below and mm-hmm. Greta's End, and then after Taken King, what they did was, and I reported this on Kotaku, what Bungie decided was we are we can't do this anymore. This is just too much. This is too hard for us to do. Our uh, the tools that we work with are really hard to deal with. It's hard for us to make this much content. It's just hard making content in general. Um, and they said, we are going to do uh, a sl- uh, like a smaller, a drip feed of smaller stuff, and we're going to put up the Eververse, sell microtransactions, and make money that way. And Activision said, okay. It was part of their renegotiated deal. Um, and they got to a point where they they didn't have to be cranking out as much content, mm-hmm. and now they're back to the same pattern where they have yeah. to crank out these DLCs and just be making content constantly. And mm-hmm. of course, because of the big contract they signed with Activision, Bungie is still on the hook for like a Destiny three, whatever that is going to look like. Mm-hmm. So you got to think that even right now there are people. I don't know if you guys heard that Bungie just put out a podcast a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. and on it, Luke Smith now talks about how his title now is like director of the destiny franchise, franchise. <laughs> or like that. so you got to think that even right now they're still thinking about what's next and there's only i don't know exactly how many people are doing what but uh there's different teams and some are still working on destiny 2 others are thinking about what's coming next expansions future games so there's just so much that they have to do um it's it's easy to see how a company with this much pressure, with this much ambition, with this much like of Activision expecting certain revenue targets from them. It's mm-hmm. just so much, and it's easy to see how they might comprom- make compromises and yeah. do things that don't seem to make sense to us, but might be necessary for them to even ship a game at all. Um, streamlining things, just doing some of the things that people don't like. Another aspect of all this is that with Destiny 2, they wanted to make a game that new players could come in and play because they desperately needed to appeal to new players. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's been this ongoing tension is that like Destiny 2, as it shipped, the original version of Destiny 2 is really appealing if you're a new player. Uh, And if you're someone who's like a casual player and only wants to play the campaign and then maybe a couple of things afterwards and some PVP and then moves on to something else. But if you're a hardcore destiny player, like us, like, like we all are, (laughs) like the people who post on the destiny Reddit are, if you're someone who's used to playing hundreds and hundreds of hours and destiny two is way less appealing to you. Um, so that tension has always been there. And like, these are not, it's easy for armchair Reddit analysts to propose solutions to a lot of problems, but, uh, oftentimes it's, executing on those ideas is a lot more difficult than people really think. So yeah, so that was my kind of long-winded answer to how could this possibly (laughs) happen? I I think there are so many possible factors here Mm -hmm. and there's so many explanations and it's not like, like even people at Bungie, if you ask someone at Bungie, like how did Destiny 2 ship the way it did? They wouldn't be able to answer you because there's so many different like complicated factors and so many mm-hmm. hundreds of people working on this game and all of them are making their own decisions and do, like doing their own things even something as simple as communicating among the studio just basic factor like basic yeah. things uh, basic ideas of what the plan is that itself is such a challenge that like just putting together this massive game and keeping it 
going is just <laughs> unfathomable to me at least. So not to sound like a bungee shell or whatever, but I do empathize a lot with the problems that they have to deal with and mm-hmm. it can't be it can't be easy. There are a lot of challenges here. So yeah. with all those challenges in mind and, and your understanding of how video games are developed and everything, do you do you think Destiny 2 is a full sequel to Destiny 1 or is it more along the lines of Destiny 1.5 or 1.75. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a, it's technically a sequel. It definitely feels like Destiny 1.5 from a from a <laughs> hardcore player's perspective. Um, it's it's kind of a bummer. I was hoping for more. I was hoping <clears> for <throat> something better. I really enjoyed what Destiny 2 I did play. Like I I love the campaign. I thought that was great. The music is astounding. Um, the the overall experience that I had for like 60 to 80 hours of Destiny 2 was great. And then I tapered off in a way that I never did of Destiny 1. And I think that there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them actually is that they split up the player base now with the PC release. And some of my raid group is playing on PC. Um, <laughs> and I don't have a gaming PC yet, so I can't join them yet. But uh, it's uh, it's it hasn't been as sticky for me as destiny one was and it does make me wonder uh, about the future for the destiny franchise and if other games will take its place and i don't know I- i'm very curious to see what happens to answer your question yeah it definitely felt like destiny 1.5 um when i first saw it when i first played it at e3 of this year and then again when i played the real version it just felt like more destiny um the fact that so so from a player's perspective, something like the fact that there isn't even a new race is to me just like disconcerting. It's like weird. It's it's like how can you release an entirely <laughs> new game and not even have a new race? But then from the part of me that is like, oh, I actually understand how this stuff works. Um, it's, oh, of course there isn't a new race. They had to crank this thing out in such a short amount of time that the the sheer amount of work it would take to make a new race and make it fun and make it interesting and introduce players to it was just like inconceivable to them. They had to deal with all this other stuff. So, yeah, I get it. I get why it is Destiny 1.5, but <clears throat> it definitely is. Yeah. So, specifically, in, 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 in D2, where did Bungie get it right? And where did they get it wrong? And what I mean by it, you can, I mean, it, it could be, refer to anything. It could be PvP. It could be, you know, story mission design. It could be the campaign itself. So where did they get it right? And where did they get it wrong? Um, so just my personal. Sure. Absolutely. Well, so where they got it right is, yeah, the story is much better. Uh, just focusing a story around a villain was smart. Uh, they did it in Taken King and it worked. And then they did it again for D2 and it worked really well. Um, there were some just really cool missions, just some excellent like Halo caliber mission design in the story campaign. Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, a lot of the the production values are better than ever. The shooting still feels as good as it ever did. But then there are some big mistakes, I think, that have contributed to me bouncing off the game. One of those is the weapon system. I think I've gone back and forth on it, on the fact that your primaries and secondaries are pretty much the same thing now, um, and ultimately settled on the fact that I hate it, and <laughs> the fact that I just can't use like sniper rifles and shotguns mm-hmm. in, in, uh, in PvE anymore. It really mm-hmm. bums me out. It's great for PvP. But then with PvP, the fact that they decided to put everything into playlists, and that you can't even choose what mode you want to yeah. play anymore, it just really bummed me out and made me think, you know what, I mean, I, I this game just wants to waste my time if I have to cycle through playlists just to get the stuff that I want to play, mm-hmm. um, if I just want to play Elimination or whatever. Um, there's, a, I could go on and on. Obviously, the microtransactions are the mm-hmm. biggest thing that is that the community is in uproar mm-hmm. over at the moment. Um, to me, I've never really cared about cosmetics, so that doesn't really make me as mad as other players i i can understand why players are mad that stuff that would be standard drops in destiny one is now locked behind tests test everest in in destiny two so i get why people are mad about that although to me personally like it's not i i don't care about the microtransaction store mm-hmm. um but yeah there are a lot of things um the i i wish they had shipped with more like secret quests like uh, like the black, black spindle, spindle stuff, oh, yeah. so much fun. Crime stuff, 
mm-hmm. was always my favorite part of D1, and the fact that there was nothing really like that in Destiny 2 was really, really disappointing, um, especially because now that they have these great open-world maps with all these destinations and uh, lost sectors, and it felt like they had the beginnings of that, but then they didn't actually fill it up with any interesting mm-hmm. side quests or like cool <laughs> hidden weapons. Um, to to make it interesting so lost sectors wound up just being a drag um <clears throat> just not rewarding at all and yeah it, it just doesn't feel i mean speaking personally i don't know i think it would be very difficult for them to get me back spending a ton of time on it um chris of osiris i just kind of blazed through the campaign and was like this is it and then just put it down and like just moved on to another game. There are too many good games for me to get stuck in Destiny 2 the way that I got mm-hmm. sucked into D1 and the innovation is gone and the novelty of D1 is gone mm-hmm. and the mystery is gone. Um, the idea that like, that hey, you need to be continually working on your character because the new raid is coming along and you got to keep up with all your friends and to me that's not there anymore in large part because of the console PC split. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's probably the main reason that I'm just not into it anymore. But mm-hmm. yeah, there are a lot of reasons, and, and <clears throat> it's kind of sad. But it's also kind of like, hey, uh, I have more time to spend on other things that are not Destiny, so I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. So, um, I did see on Reddit, um, you had responded to a post about the microtransactions and the Eververse and things like that. So, uh-huh. correct me if I'm wrong. You said that you had the scoop first, and then Bungie told you to wait on that, and then they put it in a twab or something like that. <laughs> do you mind just explaining that <laughs> yeah so they didn't yeah. tell me to wait they well not wait me. but like yeah, yeah. so what happened mm-hmm. was so uh yeah so i wrote this on reddit so it was a monday and i had found out this was as i was it was like a couple of weeks before i ran the big story about what happened to d1's development and so in the course of reporting that story i found out that they were planning on moving into microtransactions and selling microtransactions in destiny and so i sent bungie an email bungie's pr rep an email i said hey I uh, just found out about this. As always, wanted to give you guys a chance to comment. Um, if you could get back to me in the next three hours, that would be great. Um, I, I think it was 5 p.m. Eastern when I sent the email. I said, if you could get back to me by 8 p.m. Eastern, fantastic. Um, they said, uh, we'll see what we can do. We'll get back to you. About an hour and a half later, as I was leaving work, I got a call from Bungie's PR rep. Uh, being like, hey, we're putting up, we're putting up our posts now. Um, wow. I was like, Jesus fucking Christ! So I sprinted <laughs> back to the office. I was like, I'm going to the subway. I sprinted back to the office because mm-hmm. I had already like written a post up because mm-hmm. uh, I wanted to make sure we were going to hit the news as soon as I, I was ready. So I was able to get back and just like do some tweaks on that post and get my story up just about like like. A few like a few seconds after Bungie's article mm-hmm. went live, but yeah, but it was a real dick move because they were originally <laughs> planning on running it yeah. during like running the news during the this weekend Bungie, which was Thursday. Mm-hmm. It's always on Thursday, so that was going to be three days later, and they just rushed it up because they knew that I had a story coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I understand that they wanted it to come from their mouth and they wanted it to be like they're they are in control of the message. I get that part. Um, but I think it would have been pretty easy for them to just be like, hey, we want this to come from us, so we'll send you a statement that you can include in your post. Mm-hmm. And I would have been happy to put that statement in my article instead of yeah. them just like totally dicking me over <laughs> and run themselves on their blog. Um, so that's something that, mm-hmm. that I will never forget, that, that particular uh, yeah. jerk move on their part. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get why they did it, but but like still, come on Bungie. Still <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like their vision on Eververse has changed from D1. So would that be on the publisher or them themselves on Bungie? Well, has their vision changed? It seems like it's just ramping up more of the it's, same. It's, yeah, it seems like Well, that's true, but it's also like the raid doesn't have a ship, it doesn't have a sparrow, it doesn't have anything. Well, it has gear, but not um, cosmetic gear, and it seems mm-hmm. like all the cosmetics is coming from Eververse. Like, if you want an exotic ghost, you go to Eververse. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, so no. I think that, that they have... 
Bungie has certain numbers that Activision expects them to hit, certain mm-hmm. revenue targets, and I don't know if... Uh, I remember hearing rumblings that, like, that Bungie wasn't super happy about the... Mm-hmm. Or that Activision wasn't super happy with the Eververse revenue numbers mm-hmm. throughout the the cycle of Destiny 1. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that, so don't quote me on the exact oh. specifics there, mm-hmm. but it's easy to envision a scenario where Activision was like, hey, you need to hit these targets, do mm-hmm. it however you want, because I think Activision gives Bungie a lot of freedom to do things their own way so mm-hmm. long as they hit their deadlines and hit their targets. And so Bungie says to themselves, okay, we need to get more people buying things. How can we do that? Creating all these cool emotes, finding ways to get people buying it more, maybe taking away some things that were there before and dangling them in front of players as uh, microtransaction bait. Yeah. And yeah, it's easy to see a world where, like, it's not like the people of Bungie are evil. They just have to hit they expanding have to hit targets. And it's not like the people at Activision are evil. They just have to make a profit on their mm-hmm. game. It's literally their jobs is to serve to shareholders increasing revenue numbers every single yeah. year. So mm-hmm. so we're talking about a system where it's if if one party is not happy with the other, the other will have to uh, like make amends for that and find ways to to mm-hmm. account for that. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't know specifics. I don't know the numbers. I don't know exactly oh, yeah, what not. Bungie's revenue targets are. Mm-hmm. But anytime you see something like, anytime you see a microtransaction store like gradually taking over more and more of a game or like grad- gradually expanding to be more and more appealing you can safely assume that that's because the company behind it has numbers that they have to hit and they're, they need a way to hit those numbers. Mm-hmm. Do you see a, e- not an easy fix, but a fix to the, this whole microtransaction problem that's currently in the game? No. I think it's going to get worse. <laughs> Jeez, I, I, I mean, honestly, I think we're going to see it like more and more. Yeah. I think that the more players get outraged, the more companies will find insidious, more insidious ways to add microtransactions and make money because mm-hmm. these companies, it's their job to deliver year over year returns oh. and have increases. And the interesting thing about uh, public video game publishers mm-hmm. is that they're not just about when you're a publicly traded company in the United States mm-hmm. or in Europe, I guess, or Japan. You're not tra- just trying to make sure that you are hitting the same revenue targets. And like, you're not just trying to make money, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say I own a company and my, uh, my profits this year are a million dollars. And then next year, I come back to my shareholders and say, guess that, guess what? Great news. We made you a million dollars again. The shareholders are not going to be happy because they don't want to see a million dollars. They want to see more than the previous year. They want to see a year over year return and they want to see $1.5 million. So they can say, whoa, this went up 50% and et cetera, et cetera. This just happens quarter after quarter, year after year. People, the investors, the stockholders, they don't want to see just simple revenue uh, increases. Every like they don't want to see this a flat revenue, even if they're <clears throat> making money. They don't want to see that stay the same. They want to see those numbers go up and up every single year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and across the entire video game industry, any publicly traded company, you're only you're just going to see uh, uh, more and more ways to make money on top of the sixty dollars that people are already paying for video games. Yeah. So. What what do you think the number one thing that hurts video game developers today would be then? The number one thing that hurts the individuals or uh, the company? Or the companies. Online? The companies themselves. Like right now we're talking obviously about um test ever reverse and then the whole microtransaction system and it just seems like and it it, it something it infuriates me a little bit because all those things that we could have achieved in D one are now locked behind a paywall mm-hmm. in which you have to spend a a lot of money and B you're not even guaranteed the item that you want. Cause it's, it's a completely mm-hmm. random thing. Right. So it, you know, when, in terms of like, you know, the, the development cycle or how fast these companies want to make their, their return on investment. What do you, what do you think the number one thing that hurts video game companies are? 
Well, so there are two things. One is that, as we saw with Star Wars Battlefront 2, enough internet rage will make a company change, or at least <laughs> temporarily change their plans. What happened was with Battlefront was that EA, uh, the night before the game was going to launch, because of all the outrage over the loot boxes in their game, they just pulled microtransactions entirely and still haven't. They said they're going to add them back in, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, so that's that's always... A possibility is like enough outrage and we've seen this with Bungie a million times where they have to respond to people getting mad about something or another whether it's like three of coins or uh, uh, ex- the experience system or whatever else mm-hmm. um, and the other thing is that if a microtransaction system isn't successful at doing what it needs to do which is making money then it's not going to work for them and they'll find some other way to do it maybe some more devious way or maybe something that seems more fair to people um i i think that that like for example with with the eververse if bungie in their calculations they figured out that people were less inclined to spend money on randomized loot boxes than they were to just pay directly for the loot that they want the cosmetic stuff that they want then maybe bungie would change their system but i am skeptical <laughs> of that and i actually think that that people do tend to like loot boxes or people do tend to spend money on loot boxes. And I think that companies like this are especially looking for the whales who will spend hundreds, thousands, sometimes even five, six figures on these loot boxes because they're just addicted and it's got that psychological like slot machine style of uh, compulsion where it just pulls you in. And I think that a lot of these companies are relying on that and finding success internally when they look at their numbers, they're saying, hey, you know what? People are complaining about the Eververse, but as long as we've got these whales spending hundreds of dollars every week on this thing, then we're in good shape. And I don't know if that's the case. If it's not the case, then they will no doubt change their ways. Um, and I think Bungie uh, is is not Bungie does not want to be in a position. The people in charge of Bungie do not want to be in a position where everybody hates them, even if they are making money. So for them, it's got to be a balance, and they do have to find ways to uh, put out this stuff without making people too mad. I don't know if we've hit the point where they have to change the Eververse at this point, despite all the forum postings and whatnot. I think that that they're probably having all sorts of meetings about it and talking about it and figuring out, hey, is this like a temporary spike of anger? Is this going to be a thing? How do we address this thing? Um, I'm sure that they are trying to find ways to deal with it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not... It's it's hard to say how it will really hurt them or if it will really hurt them uh, without knowing... <laughs> how much money people are actually spending. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So in your book, you explained how Bungie really wanted to be separate from Microsoft. And Jason Jones, he was really like threatening to quit the job and start up his own studio and things like that. So Mm -hmm. my question is like, why was Mr. Jones like so anxious to be apart from Microsoft? Um, Well, I can't speak for Jason Jones. Mm -hmm. I've never actually even talked to him. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that the studio is, well, no, I mean, just, just like only, I can only say what I've heard from other people about Mm -hmm. his thinking. So I can't definitively say this is what he was thinking. (laughs) But, but the overall sense that I've gotten is that he and everyone else at Bungie wanted to be in charge of their own destiny. Hence destiny. No, they wanted to be in charge of their own fate and uh, like own their own IP, be totally responsible. I think they were really upset with the idea that they could create something that's like a billion dollar franchise in Halo mm-hmm. and then have it belong to someone else yeah. and not be able to see the profits themselves. And so that was their whole big thing. And that's the reason that they signed the contract with Activision when they were going out and trying to find a publisher for their next big game. Mm-hmm. They their big condition was we have to own the IP we we own destiny we want to own destiny um so that's a big thing that was their whole big thing is they wanted to be independent um among other there there's all sorts of reasons why a company might want to be independent mm-hmm. you, you want to prove that you can do things on your own without this parent company mm-hmm. you don't want this parent company coming in and interfering uh and and like mistreating your baby your games and help uh, like making decisions over your head you don't want them to have any control you want to be in control of your own fate so yeah there are a lot of reasons why a company might want to go independent and we've seen that a few times in the past in the video game industry with companies wanting to go or remain independent because they want to be in control of their own fate yeah um so 
Jason Jones, because he was the game director for Destiny One, correct? Um, it seems like it, right? I, I believe I, he. So, so he was the project lead. I believe that was his title on Destiny One. Um, there's some dispute over when, how much time he actually spent on the game. Mm-hmm. He was definitely he was he was responsible for making the decision in the summer of uh, 2013 to reboot the story, and it was mm-hmm. him who was sitting there powering and being like, "Hey, we got to do this. We got to yeah. do this, this, and this." Um, so, and and yeah, obviously a lot of it came from him in the first place. A lot of the original ideas and a lot of the the uh ambition for destiny came from him but yeah. it's it's a very there were a lot of like alpha personalities on this game oh yeah um a lot of people who who were like director level people who mm-hmm. all <clears throat> have lots of big personalities and lots of strong opinions about what destiny <laughs> should be so you just brought up a great question Oh, in my head. Um, do you know what the title project lead actually means? Um, well, it can mean different things at different mm-hmm. studios. At at Bungie, uh, I believe that it means, well, whatever it is, whether it's called like creative director or oh, yeah. project lead or whatever <clears throat> else, there, there's often different nomenclature for it. I, I believe it means that you're the person who's taking meetings with every department every day and just trying to make sure that everyone has a consistent vision and saying like, mm. hey, and just making all these decisions about what, what the game should be. And people come to you with, with questions. And um, I mean, just what I've heard is the role of a director generally is Mm -hmm. you wake up, you go to the office, you have meetings all day, like from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. or whatever. And and you're just meeting with people and they're asking you questions about what the game should look like and you're giving them answers and uh, trying to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So that's kind of like, it's like a very high level, like just broad overview of everything. Thank you. That was a great answer. That answered a lot of my own personal questions. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, my next question is, it seems like there was a lot of drama there throughout the summer of 2013 and things like that after the first Destiny trailer at E3 between Marty O'Donnell, Activision, Jason Jones and things like that. Um, In your book, you explained it perfectly. Um, Do you mind explaining for our audience what exactly happened? I know it's a lot, but like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So so Destiny was in development for a long time. earliest earliest pre-production was like around like just when they went independent they were still they were talking about like what their next project would be so that would be 2007 um so this game just people were making concept art and thinking of ideas and talking about it for years and years Mm -hmm. um so in about 2000 in the summer 2013 uh there were questions all around the studio about the story and what the story was going to be and so the way that it has been told to me is that basically uh, Joe Staten, who was the writer, the longtime writer of Bungie, he had written the previous Halo games that Bungie worked on and now was in charge of the story for Destiny. And he had a team of writers. And so uh, he was asked to put together a... Uh, I'm, I, actually, I'm not sure if he was asked. Yeah, I think he was asked, but he might have chosen to do this himself. No, I think he was asked uh, mm-hmm. to put together this video presentation called the Supercut. And yeah. the Supercut was not just a video, but it was it was like almost like a PowerPoint presentation. I believe it had uh, some unfinished video clips and some mm-hmm. art and some uh, dialogue. And it was kind of like a rough work in progress version of the story. And it would hit all of the beats of the story and people could see it and uh, uh, just get a sense of what Destiny's story would be. Um, And it was sent to some of the high-level staff at Bungie. And overall, I have not seen this thing, but from what I've heard, people were just like, what the hell is this? People were confused. (laughs) People didn't understand it. People were super, like, not happy with the state of it. Uh, as a result of all this, eventually Jason Jones decided we're scrapping this. We're starting from scratch. We're getting everyone in a room together. We're going to just start all over again on the story. And so they ha- took a lot of what they had created for the original story and kind of reworked it and patched it back to like ripped it up and then patched it back together as this new story that would become destiny one's actual story and you can kind of you can see a lot of that when you play destiny one so Mm -hmm. 
hence all of these characters that come out from nowhere and are never explained, like the stranger who was originally supposed to be someone else entirely. I believe she was going to be the assistant to Osiris or something like that. Osiris mm-hmm. was going to be a character in the original version of the story. Um, the queen's brother, the blue skinned dude, he was going to be uh, a different character entirely, like a roguish, like Han Solo type of character, if I remember correctly. And yeah, there was this entirely different story. Um, and yeah, and and you can see the uh, the the results of that in Destiny One. But as a result of this, Joe Staten wound up leaving the studio mm-hmm. um, that summer, and he uh, he and then the drama with Marty O'Donnell is a separate thing. That's that involves Marty O'Donnell just being really unhappy with the way mm-hmm. that Activision put out a trailer that didn't use his audio, mm-hmm. uh, a Destiny trailer that didn't actually use his audio. And so he started tweeting about it, and that was the beginning of the end for him it, <laughs> because it led to a whole lot of tension and problems and mm-hmm. eventually led to him getting fired the, the following year. And uh, the music of Spheres, that actually leaked online. I, yeah, just this yeah, week it came yeah, out. It, on finally. Christmas, I believe. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Good. I, <laughs> I, I think really good. I think those guys, the leakers, had that planned. Oh yeah, yeah. It's kind of like here's our gift to you guys. Mm. Mm. I, well, so what happened was uh, this kid named Owen Spence. He's like 17 or 18. He had been talking to me for a while because he was trying to recreate Music of the Spheres. Music of the Spheres, by the way, for people who don't know, is this musical prelude to Destiny that Marty O'Donnell wrote with a bunch of other composers, including Paul McCartney, the former Beatle. And so this was going to be this like uh, uh, epic eight-part composer. And uh, he they finished it. They finished recording it. Um, I believe at the end of 2013 or the end of 2012, something like that. Uh, but Activision never released it. Bungie never released it. They just sat on it. It was indefinitely shelved. And so this guy, Owen Spence, this kid, he had been kind of trying to recreate uh, music of the spheres through stuff that was publicly available. And uh, they came pretty close, Marty had said. But they couldn't get everything, obviously, because not all of it had been publicly put anywhere. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, he was contacted, he and his friend, who they were working on it together, they were contacted last week by someone who had a copy of Music of the Spheres and was like, hey, here you go, and gave it to them. <laughs> and so they put it out this week, um, which was, yeah, a cool surprise. It's really good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, Jay, I'm just going to pass it over to you for your questions. No, I Honestly, I've exhausted all my questions. Yeah. Uh, Jason, you have done an Mr. amazing yeah. job. At Mr. answering every question I had. <laughs> Mr. Schreier, you answer questions great, man. Um, <laughs> you went through, like, with your answers, so many topics of questions that we had, and you just answered them all. <laughs> it, it was great. That's- it's because you didn't, you didn't, are you saving the, the really tough ones when you're going to give me the Chris Matthews <laughs> hardball, like, I like some really tough all right, ones. All right, all right, all right. Where here, are the here, bodies buried? Here, here's your tough one. You ready? <laughs> no. Are you, still play- <laughs> are you still playing Destiny right now? And I haven't. Since Curse of- I mean, I played Curse of Osiris uh-huh. just because oh. I had to for work. Mm-hmm. But, um. It's yeah, so I, I approach it differently because I have to cover it for my job and write about it for Kotaku. Yeah. So my my personal, like, I haven't played it for non-work reasons since September. September, yeah. like, after doing the raid, I never even finished the raid. Um, oh, I did the raid oh. a couple times with some friends and was just like, all right, I think I'm done with Destiny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, which right. is sad, but also kind of freeing. Well... I guess I guess, I guess here's a really good question then. Um, obviously, we've all seen Twitter, we've read the Reddit. People, some people are saying the game's great. Others think this is like this the uh, the worst thing ever created by man. What are some things that gamers should try to keep in perspective when video game companies actually release their product? Uh, that the people behind them are real people with real feelings. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> And that everything you say on the internet is like every time you call a developer lazy when they've just got finished like like a, a hundred hour week to finish a game mm-hmm. is is just like it's painful. like pouring salt in their wounds. <laughs> um, actually, to Bungie's credit, from what I hear, they've really done a good job of eliminating crunch or or at least really? temperate like like mitigating it. Um, so cool. I don't think they have to crunch as much as other game studios have. But in general, just like if you play video games and talk about them on the internet, just always remember that 
there are people behind those games and mm-hmm. they might be reading what you say. I think a good rule of thumb, and I try to practice this as much as possible, is anything you say on the internet, assume if you're talking about someone on the internet, assume that they are reading what you're writing. And never write anything online that you wouldn't say to someone in their like someone's face. So mm-hmm. if you're thinking about like trashing Bungie, just imagine saying that to the faces of people at Bungie and and mm-hmm. just think about it that way before like feel free to criticize but uh but do, it, do it in a way that that like you would say it to their faces. That's my advice. Yeah. Um, I do have two quick questions. Um, okay. Have you? I there was a leak online about the next DLC. Have you heard anything about that God of Mar- God of Mars? I think it's called. Unless you're working on an article, and you don't want to say it. <laughs> yeah. I no, I'm not not at the moment. I I didn't. Mm-hmm. I I think I saw something about a leak, but it didn't seem yeah. like it was a particularly reputable source. I, I haven't looked too closely. Yeah. Um, but I no, I I don't know anything about. I I think that this one is uh is. I think, but I think it is on Mars, from what I remember. Uh, I think it's like uh, High Moon Studios. I think are the developers that are working on it, if I remember correctly. Okay, sweet. Thank you. And just one quick question: um, Do you know what Jason Jones' role is right now? I know you're not there working there, but like, I know he's not really a director, or maybe he is a, a director on D three. Um, do you know exactly like what his role is? Or is he um, just like management? I don't know what his title is. I think yeah. he well he's very much yeah, he's still there. He's still mm-hmm. very much at the top of the food chain. Um he's not technically the CEO, but it's yeah. very clear that he is the the person with the most power at Bungie. Um he mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't know exactly what he's doing now. I'm sure that he has his hands in everything and I'm sure yeah. that he is enjoying his millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Schreier, for joining us. Sure, thanks for having we me. We had guys. a great thank episode. You. Thank you so much. You answered all our questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did my best. <laughs> so where can we find you on social media? Um, God, I hate social media. Uh, you can <laughs> find me on Twitter. Uh, my name is Jason Schreier. Um, you can find Blood, Sweat, and Pixels on Amazon or any other mm. store, Barnes & Noble. Uh uh, what are are there any other bookstores these days other than Barnes um, and Noble? I don't think so. Amazon, <sighs> I think that's Google. your local bookstore. Support your local bookstore. <laughs> um, you can get it digitally. You can get it. You can get the audiobook read by Ray Chase, aka Noctis from Final Fantasy 15, is the narrator of the audiobook. So check that out. Nice. And yeah, if you're a Destiny fan or you're interested in how video games are made, you should definitely check out the book. The book is good. I highly recommend it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. J Ram. Uh, you can find me, uh, J underscore Rambo919 on Twitter, Twitch, you name it, it's there. <laughs> Sweet. You guys can find me on Twitter at J underscore DTR, Destiny Tracker on Twitter at Destiny Track, and on YouTube at Destiny Tracker. Again, Jason Shari, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank right, you. Guys. Um, happy New Year, everyone, and we'll see you guys all later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>